Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Lexington. Hi, all the creatives out there. So um, people will probably know you, Justin, you've sp spoken previously, but m probably a little bit less familiar with Sarah, so we're excited to dive into your story. Um, we're talking about resilience. You couldn't go anywhere this year without hearing about the theme resilience. So let's start a little bit. I know. Let's go uh, personal story first. Justin, tell us a little bit about what resilience means to you? What has this been personally over the last year? Yeah, so uh, thanks all, and thanks for hanging out with us today and put questions and everything in the chat because we definitely want to communicate with you all. So for me personally, I think the folks close to me know that this year has been an extra bit of resilience. Um, we as educators have had to be resilient in lots of ways we're going to get into in just a bit. Uh, but we're all dealing with personal stories of resilience as well. Uh, just reflecting with Jamie this morning, tons of personal resilience. Uh, for me, I turned 40 during the pandemic. Um, so yay, 40, not really. Uh, anyway, six days after turning 40 though, I uh, got a cancer diagnosis, um, rectal cancer. There has been many fun poop jokes in my life for the last year. Um, so I have been through the whole thing with chemo and uh, surgeries and um, radiation and the whole cancer experience, uh, which is an experience, um, good days and bad. Uh, but for me, I think it, it turned out to be a massive blessing. Of course, there's some personal resilience going on, but really the city was resilient around me. Uh, lots of different layers of this city sort of came around me uh, from UK to uh, STEAM Academy, which is a school we got to start here in town. Um, so many different layers. And uh, I actually have been so um, soul refreshed mm -hmm. by going through this last year and experiencing cancer with the city and the pandemic. And uh, actually, I think that it it made me feel much more optimistic about everything that we've all been through together. So, yep, we're on the downhill side now. I find out in a couple of weeks whether this whole uh, year's worth of cancer effort has, has resulted in a, in a good outcome. So that's definitely a story of personal resil resilience. We'll talk <coughs> lots more, but I think those lessons learned about just what's going on with me at a time when you thought, I can't take one more thing, and then something really big happens. Yeah. All right, Sarah, what about you? What's your personal resilience story? Yeah. Well, I have to start by saying that I feel very fortunate that um, I didn't have a health scare and a health issue like Justin did. So I feel really fortunate that that was something that didn't come up. But um, I'm the head of a, a small private school mm -hmm. in Lexington, and um, I have a husband and two amazing boys. Um, and one who's graduating high school tomorrow and a middle schooler. And I think where my resilience had to come in this year is, you know, at the very beginning of all of this, I felt like I was too divided and I couldn't do any one job well enough. Um, and so I had to focus on what I could do and not what I couldn't do. Um, mm. because it became clear from the beginning that if I felt like I wasn't doing enough for this group of people or I wasn't doing enough as a mom. So I tried to divide my time and take care of myself as much as I could so I could be there for all the many people who needed me this year. Well, and I really appreciate Justin because when we were brainstorming this topic, he said you cannot talk about this year without talking about mothers and without mm. talking about teachers. Mm -hmm. So bringing up that mother component of just focusing on the next day and what I can do, I think mm -hmm. that really resonates with me of, all right, not what I can't do, but yeah. what's the next thing. Yeah. All right, so we've talked a little bit about personal resilience. Now let's get into the topic of education. This is where you two are experts at, um, a topic that has been really resilient. Mm -hmm. So Justin, lay the landscape for us. What's been happening the last year? What's going to be happening? Just big picture before we dive into Sarah's story. Yeah, well, if you have any relationship to schools, even if you're a, a grandma, you know we have been through a year uh, with education. Um, from the initial shutdown and trying to sort of figure out how to maintain some semblance of school mm. to a start of school that happened in the 20, uh, 2020, 2021 year where we had a little time to think about it. But that didn't mean that we knew what we were doing. Um, <clears throat> to uh, now all kinds of graduations going on, 
uh, proms happening. Mm -hmm. um, we've been through quite a year. Uh, educators in this year have been um, resilient to the level I didn't know that they yeah. had, honestly. Uh, you know, I can be critical from, at times of various parts of the system, uh, but I think you have to look at what happened this year and recognize the intense creativity. Mm. Um, one of the things I was sharing earlier is I got to build an online program at UK and we, we have classes all over the world. Uh, but we had like two or three years to get that up and going, to help mm. the professors get ready to teach online, to talk about how do you do this teaching and learning thing. Teachers had a weekend mm. to transition everything from I meet in class with my kid and that's all I've ever known to, okay, now my kids are coming in on Zoom. What does that look and feel like? How do I respond to that? Uh, and so teachers did what teachers do, which they are natural creators. They are really creative types. Um, and so they got creative quickly. Uh, and I think, you know, Sarah will s share some stories about that. But that's, I think, what we have to recognize. We also, like all of you hanging out in the Zoom room, yeah. hi guys, seeing you all, you all feel comfortable being teachers now, right? <sighs> I think we also learned a lot that like your average person in America uh, is not necessarily a great teacher. I can tell you from my own experience of having kids at home uh, with my wife, like we hung in there for about a week and a half as educators of small children, as elementary educators, and then um, really quickly we're like, mm, wow, this is way too hard. We need the teachers back. Yeah. Uh, so it's been an amazing year of resilience for educators. Yeah, yeah and I love that story of so many parents, once they started also being teachers on top of the other job, was like, wow, there's a lot here. There's a lot of creativity. Mm -hmm. And love what you talked about, teachers being so creative. So that naturally leads us to Sarah's story. Mm -hmm. Sarah, you're at a very um, interesting, specific, exciting school with yeah. Redwood Cooperative. So tell yeah. us a little bit about what that is and what's been yeah. going on there. Yeah. Redwood is a really magical place. Um, and today is our last day of school, so it's very bittersweet for us. A year ago at this time, I couldn't imagine that we would get here, but now that we're here, I don't want to let it go and say goodbye to all the kids for the summer. Um, but we are a small independent school in Lexington. We're pre-K through middle school, um, and we're a progressive <clears throat> education school, mm -hmm. meaning we meet children where they are. We use a lot of experiential and hands-on learning. We make lots of authentic connections. We use a lot of democracy in education, mm. so our students have a voice in the process. Um, we sort of had a little practice with changing because we use an emergent curriculum already. So um, we focus on project-based learning, and of course teachers have scopes mm. and sequences and pacing guides, but they don't know exactly what they'll be doing at any time of the year and we wait for that to wow. emerge from our students yeah. so they had a little bit of practice with that but we definitely taking that whole platform online where we're used to giving kids all of these great fantastic hands-on experiences um, was definitely a challenge in a way that we had to be really resilient we also have a huge focus on environmental sustainability um, and play in education and connecting children to nature so it was very important to us that our students still had those opportunities even when we went virtual. Absolutely, so very interesting type of school. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot more that we wanna learn and Justin knows a lot about your program. You may say why you guys know each other mm -hmm. and why you know her program so well and I want to hand sure. the floor to Justin to dig deeper into Sarah's story. Well, Sarah was my student during yeah. this last year and a half too. So there's lots of layers of education going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky and Sarah was there uh, getting a degree in education leadership. Um, and so that's why we, we know each other and so many, I get to see so many stories of mm -hmm. resiliency, mm -hmm. but I think Sarah stood out partly because you are a private school Mm -hmm. And a lot of us saw public schools go through what they were mm -hmm. going through, but private schools and universities too yeah. had this extra layer of tuition and things yeah. like that. So talk a little bit about leading a private school during this. Year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely there was a time last summer where I felt like I was kind of on this um, sinking ship and trying to just plug up as many holes as I could. Um, 
we are a private school, so we rely on tuition as our income and additional programs. We're also a cooperative school, though, so we have a huge amount of family involvement, and our families also pay a scaled tuition based on the amount of work they do for the school. So going into it knowing that we probably couldn't have those people coming in to do the work that we desperately needed um, done um, was very interesting. So um, we kind of flipped the switch and figured out how to keep our community involved. Um, financially, it was a big struggle. We, we did at one point lose about 20% of our enrollment um, over last summer and 100% of all of our additional programs that we rely on, so summer camp, extended programs, extracurriculars, and then going into it and thinking, now, now what? Now how do we make this work? So we were just, again, resilient and creative. You know, we were creative in fundraising. Um, obviously, we were very fortunate to receive some federal mm -hmm. funds and dollars, but we didn't stop there. We kept applying for other grants. We recently got a $22,000 energy education grant to teach our kids about energy education and renewable energy and put solar panels on our roof. So we just, mm. we just looked for as many opportunities as we could to continue to grow as a school and to involve our families. Mm. Yeah, awesome. I think that's a leadership creativity angle that sort of got mm. lost a little bit this year mm -hmm. of, you know, what does it take to keep the systems going? Mm -hmm. You know, there's the teaching and learning thing, the thing going on with kids and teachers, yeah. but there's also this thing going on yeah. at the systems level. Yeah. So, I happen to have a kindergartner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I happen to see what Zoom kindergarten looked and felt yeah. like in my own world. Yeah. But I'm guessing a lot of our audience didn't get to see Zoom kindergarten. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about for the early learners what oh that felt like this year? Well, for the early learners or for the teachers? Uh, you can go either um, way with it because both sides had to be resilient. Absolutely, absolutely. So for our kids, I mean, it was hard. They wanted mm. to be together. I remember some of our first Zoom calls last spring were just heartbreaking mm. because the kids just, they didn't, you know, always understand exactly what was going on or why they couldn't be together. I had, you know, a fourth grader, my first Zoom call with her just break down in tears. And so they wanted to be together. They wanted to be with their teachers. School is, is their place. You know, I always say, to my students, for us, you know, my job is this and your job is school and this is where you are and this is, you know, where you live a lot of your life. And so it was hard for them. Um, also, it's hard to focus on a screen, especially when you've come from a school where we have 90 minutes of outdoor play yeah. every day, unstructured play, and we connect them with nature and do as many of our classes outside mm -hmm. um, and all kinds of hands-on learning. For the teachers, they basically had to sing and dance. I mean, there's mm. no other way to say it, just to keep the attention of everybody yeah. you know it was um it was a challenge and i i would get pictures of teachers they would send to me where they were in like a tiara and a ball gown and you know and um just trying to make it work and be resilient and and you know there were also lots of cute connections though mm -hmm. so even through zoom when we were virtual there were so many cute connections or games that were played or you know, the teachers would do funny skits for the, the kids to teach them. You know, when they taught them how-to writing, they did skits in their own kitchens um, to teach them about writing styles. So, um, but it definitely was, it took every, I would say it took every ounce of everyone's energy this year to make it work. Awesome. So from there all the way up to our older mm -hmm. learners, you wound mm -hmm. up being a student through the pandemic mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. As a from from little kids learning on yeah. Zoom, we were yeah. also doing adults learning on Zoom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, what stands out to you as like this last year as an adult learning on Zoom oh. uh, that you can sort of speak yeah. to the resilience amongst your own classmates, yeah. right? Because there was you sure. were also a student in this game. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I started with you right before the pandemic hit, so I learned about Zoom before <laughs> I needed to learn about Zoom. You were saying, "How do you do this?" Well, we started with, "What is Zoom?" You know, um, mm -hmm. so I, I appreciated that experience. But um, yeah, I mean, there were times I wished I could have met everybody. You're with this cohort and you're going through something very special together, but knowing that you won't have the opportunity to meet. Um, but I loved hearing everybody's stories um, when we would get together via Zoom and just to hear about, it was so nice to be with a group of people who could say, without even saying two words, understand what your week was like and, yeah. and that you're all going through the same thing and bouncing ideas off of each other. I think that was 
an incredibly valuable part of all of this, hearing about their resiliency, sharing yours, and being able to gather ideas. Yeah, yeah. awesome. All right, so yeah. I can keep going, I, but I'm guessing there might be some questions yeah. starting to pop in. We so. do have some yeah. questions starting to pop in. Um, so I'm gonna give a few more, because I've got a couple, so I'm gonna ask one more question before we go to okay. some audience. So feel free to drop that in the chat. We will get to your questions. Um, we like Creative Mornings to be very interactive, mm -hmm. and it's really mm -hmm. about diving in. All right, so you guys are both leaders. And so one thing that I heard throughout this pandemic is when you're working with your teams, mm -hmm. your teams are saying, I'm, I'm having constant change. Yeah. And so how as a leader did you have to tamper down change or mm -hmm. help them with change? I can start. Okay, you start. I mean, that has been a part we've, you know, we've said we don't want to ever want to hear the word pivot, change, yeah. adjust, accommodate, you know, we're, we're but yeah, there's been a lot of change and being a teacher in general requires the ability to, to shift regularly, but this was more shifting than anyone ever yeah. anticipated. Um, and like Justin said, we did have a weekend to go virtual and to figure that out. Um, so what I tried to do is figure out what I could and couldn't help with. Mm -hmm. So um, there were times where I've, I had to say, this, this is a change we're making, so discussing whether it's an option or not is, is not beneficial, but how can I help? Um, I figured out, you know, worked some creative budgeting to figure mm -hmm. out how to give all of our teachers who were teaching in person and virtually an additional three hours of planning time a mm -hmm. week. And so even that, you know, even that helped to be able to do that. Um, understanding, lots of understanding of how hard it really was. Yeah. Um, and also giving them the space to talk about it. I felt like it was really important from the very beginning to involve every single person on our team in the process. And they were never not a part of the conversation. Um, and last summer I was mentioning earlier that I said, you don't have to be here, but we'll be here for all these meetings. And if you want to come and you want to be part of the discussion, come and the entire team would come every time. So I realized it was really important for everyone to have these discussions together. And then sometimes I just said, come in my office anytime you want to cry. Just sit yeah. there and cry or come and say, I need help. You know, definitely encouraging people to ask for help was important. Yeah, and we'll talk maybe at the later about what are those things that help you mm -hmm. be more resilient. Mm -hmm. So asking for help, I think, is a big part of yeah. when I can't take any more. And what else, yeah. you also said about communicating. There's so much change yeah. coming at us. Oh, yeah. How much of it could we be a part of versus mm -hmm. us just coming at it? Right. All exactly. right, Justin, what about you? What would your advice as a leader? So, you know, I'm, I'm like the, one of the most natural innovators you're probably going to meet. Like it is just core DNA for me. And so it was difficult for me to hit pause mm. because um, it's, I always am wanting to push systems yeah. further and, and yeah. do more. Um, however, pause was the right answer mm -hmm. for much of the last year and a half, mm -hmm. with one major exception. Um, and that major exception is I think we learned a lot this last year about equity mm. um, as we went through the uh, unrest that we went through. I think that was the one area where we didn't hit pause. Mm -hmm. And so the systems and teams that I were, was a part of, um, you know, we definitely paused the, here's how to be a better online teacher. Even that, like they were learning in real time. And I actually give teachers massive credit. They, were, they did really well adapting to tech and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but the one area that we're still unpacking and working through, but that I, mm -hmm. I felt like we didn't let up on change was like, how do we, meet kids where they are more authentically. Mm -hmm. um, we, public school systems all over Kentucky, here in Lexington, uh, built new social emotional support structures in place yeah. that weren't there before. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to do that on the fly because we were, I mean, you, you talk about teachers needing a cry. I mean, mm -hmm. kids are in the same situation yeah. and we are, there's really, for many kids, no system structure because for a lot of kids, the classroom is that place of emotional mm, support. Yeah, yeah. And now we didn't have that. So the one area that I think we could not back off on was changing for equity and in mm -hmm. um, race in particular over this mm -hmm. last year. Like we just had to pay a lot more attention in a very good way. Yeah. It actually wound up making the changes we were pursuing much mm. deeper, more real. We should have probably been there the whole time, um, mm -hmm. but 
uh, having gone through that over the last year, uh, I think it made for better change conversations, mm -hmm. especially when you strip everything else away, mm -hmm. like and we really get tight to just equity. Yeah. I feel like we've been able, we've been fortunate to be in person for the majority mm -hmm. of the school year, almost 80% of our school year we've been in, which presented its own challenges yeah. just in, um, how do you spend two hours of your day washing hands and still teach yeah. the kids and just, just things like that. And, um, and I do feel like though every moment we had with them, we appreciated so much more. Mm. And so we, we intentionally focused on all those conversations and we focused on social justice and conflict resolution and restorative justice and building relationships. And we've done a lot more social and emotional health mm. than we have. We, we always had a focus on social and emotional, you know, in our progress reports, that's at the top of the progress report because that's what's important to us. Um, but it's been intensified this year for sure. I also, I think hitting pause mm. is so important and just knowing when you have to say that's enough. Yeah. And then also I think for us, one of the best stories for me was at the very beginning of, lot of this, this school year when the teachers came back in person, um, but the kids weren't there yet. And I said, we're going to do a two-day professional development on positive discipline in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone participated. And, you know, I could see after the first little bit getting more into it and more into it. And then at the end, we did our wrap-up and we talked about it. And one of and our, our science teacher um, said to me, you know, she said, I went into this thinking I have like five million things to do. I mm. have to figure out how to do individual kits and put together yeah. kits for my at-home learners and figure out how I'm gonna do this and how am I gonna do Zoom when I'm doing this and there are just so many logistical things to do. But then I'm so glad and she thought, I don't see how we can take time for this. Yeah. And then at the end of it, you know, she felt and I think everyone agreed that they were so happy that we took the time to focus on what's important to us and why we're here, why we do what we do and who we are and that that to me was the biggest moment of in order to be resilient through this, we can't lose who we are. We can't, you know, yeah. we have to maintain our integrity and learning about how we interact with our students, how we foster an environment of mutual respect, how we help with conflict resolution. Although everyone thought we don't have time for this, we just have to go through the motions. Yeah. Um, taking the time to do the things that help maintain our integrity through the year really helped because we didn't lose sight of who we were. And that seems like such a big reflection. I've heard that a couple times as we've been talking of, I don't think I can take on one more thing, mm -hmm. but then you realize, okay, I can drop some of these other things because this is a core priority right now. Yeah. And then it becomes restorative. It really yeah. is more inspiring and you're inspired to go on and uh, more motivated. And I'll definitely take away, because I heard both of you guys say the pause. There is a time yeah. maybe when we just need to pause and that's the way to be resilient yeah. to get through it. Yeah. All right, so we have a couple questions that's come through. First off, there's been a lot of focus around some of the negative things related to the pandemic with our kids and some of their sure. development. Is there anything that you're seeing that you think will be a positive long-term for kids? Many, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and not at all hard to find in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Just on that little note that you were just talking about with discipline, school discipline, there were almost no suspensions and expulsions mm. over this last year. Um, what an interesting result. Mm. And why can't we keep it that way? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we had our challenges, right? Mostly kids not coming to school was the main challenge, mm -hmm. uh, coming to Zoom school. Um, but we also turned loose of this need to like regulate kid behavior all the time. Mm. And kids got a lot more freedom in their day than they used to have. And that's not a bad thing. And we can keep mm. that. Um, so I think that the school system has learned a lot in the pandemic. It will take years to restructure, rebuild. So, you know, don't have expectations in August. It's all going to be different. But I do think there are permanent learnings, permanent lessons that won't go away. Um, right. as part of this and we can unpack some more of them but just how we treat kids with discipline mm. is a pretty big one that yeah. I don't think will go back to the old way of doing it. 
Yeah, and then also just realizing where we needed to go with time management skills, mm. creative thinking, and problem solving based on seeing them take what we had taught them and then transfer it to a home environment. It was pretty eye-opening to see what else we needed to focus on when we did get them back. Absolutely. Yeah. Who owns the yeah. learning was the clear driver. Mm -hmm. So most of education is teachers owning the learning. When kids were independently capable of owning their own learning, they were the mm -hmm. kids that were succeeding in the pandemic. And mm -hmm. some of those kids yeah. are happy to not go back because they know how to manage their own learning now. Mm -hmm. And I'm good. I don't, like, you give me the tasks, I'll get them done in a couple mm -hmm. hours, and then I'll have the rest of the day to myself. Yeah. Um, so that'll be interesting to, for those kids that do own their learning. But so much of what was missing before was teachers owning the learning for kids. Mm, yeah. And in that context, when we switched and went on to Zoom, if you're a kid in that context and you didn't have ownership of your own learning, mm -hmm. you, you were left to fend for yourself and many kids right. didn't have the skills they needed to mm, do that. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we've got to take that task on way earlier. That, mm -hmm. That's not a college transition skill. That's a second grade ownership skill of your own learning. Right, and what about assessments? I think, mm -hmm. you know, um, statewide assessments are always a topic of conversation yeah. and how we authentically assess student learning and give them the opportunities to show, I do believe, um, and this is the way we do things at Redwood, that yeah. they should have many opportunities mm -hmm. to demonstrate their learning in a variety of formats. Um, so, all teachers now had to be flexible and mm -hmm. because they couldn't implement implement some of the standardized testing that they yeah. had in the past so they all had to be flexible in figuring out those assessments and I think that might be a long-term thing yeah. that sticks around that it will still take years to figure it out but I think having that eye-opening experience for many schools of having to assess their students in a different format might be a positive carryover because they can now continue to figure out how to make those more authentic yeah, and we got a question really related mm -hmm. to this, sticking with this theme of, you used to hear a lot of, when we get back to normal, when we get back to normal, um, as a community, how do we continue to advocate for our schools to build in more time, doing some of the things that you guys are talking about, or to pause instead of mm -hmm. feeling like the need to push and go, go, go? Do you see that happening? Mm -hmm. I, I, I definitely do. I hope it happens. Yeah. I'm, I'm, um, really passionate advocate for, for all schools. And, um, you know, we have been able to allow the kids the time to create conflicts and solve conflicts, but I would love to see it happening more statewide. Um, so I do think having to flip everything on its head and think, okay, now I, you know, I went from this and feeling like I had to get everything in and I had a very strict structure to how can I do even a quarter of what I did Maybe now, when we're when we're back to normal, as you know, people say, um, maybe now we meet in the middle and we figure mm -hmm. out. Okay, we saw that we could make it work without doing all of this pushing at the beginning, and and all of the standardized testing and all of that. Maybe we meet in the middle now, and we still do implement some of those opportunities for kids to have a voice and to lead some of their education, um, and to just take a pause and take a moment in the day to allow kids to be kids. Mm. Yeah, if I had to add, add on to that, um, I think particularly the standardized testing thing mm -hmm. is um, something that we all should learn, including the community. It's not mm -hmm. just us as, as educators. Mm -hmm. What we were doing with standardized testing was forcing schools into this really tight, constrained box where mm -hmm. the rational choice for schools was just push more content into those mm -hmm. kids all day long. Like we're gonna read, 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 and we're not gonna stop mm -hmm. reading, 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 reading all the time. For some kids that love reading, that's a good fit. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of kids that it wasn't a good fit before. So the idea of going back to normal to them is terrible. They mm -hmm. do not want school to go back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all, as both educators and community, need to seek something better than normal. If we mm -hmm. just go back to normal, we know what normal school does. Mm -hmm. It gets about half the kids go to college, only about half of those kids wind up graduating college. Like we know what normal does, and there's a whole lot of kids not well served by normal. Mm -hmm. And so we 
really should not seek to go back to normal. Obviously, we need schools. I think we all learned this last year during the pandemic that if you don't have the schools open, the factories shut down. Mm -hmm. That's a really big problem. Mm -hmm. And so we need schools as part of the fabric of community. And one just super side note, one thing that schools did that they don't get a lot of love for is early in the pandemic, schools became the food delivery mm. mechanism for most of society. Uh, millions of meals got delivered by Kentucky schools uh, to fill this critical food shortage gap. Mm. Like we, when we think school, we don't really think about they're the main food provider mm. in a community, but they are a major food provider in the community. So yeah. we need school, but what we return to should not be the old version of school. It, it should be embedded with some of these lessons. And a lot of the lessons are slow down, mm -hmm. be more human oriented, be more kid oriented, take the time to let them explore, play, do projects. That's, I mean, Redwood had that in their yeah. DNA early. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, if you go back and watch that last Creative Mornings talk yeah. that I did, right? Like that was where we were trying to get schools to go. But I think yeah. the pandemic just like triples down. Mm. Oh yeah, we really needed to be doing those things. And so I hope we go mm. back and we do some of that. Yeah. So this is a big one and we'll see how, how you guys think. Someone asked with all the federal dollars coming to schools <laughs> and you could say, I don't know, let's mm. just pass on this. What will that do to the school environment? It's big, it's different, it's changing. I mean, I can, I've never seen, we as educators, Mm -hmm. We are extremely good at being efficient with, do with dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of sections of the community that like to complain about um, schools and what we spend money on. Uh, but if you compare schools to corporations, I mean, schools are so efficient with money. And we're good. And we've had our, my entire history as an educator has been working with extremely tight budgets. Mm. And now we do have this huge infusion of money um, that schools are trying to figure out. It's a brand new problem we've not had before. Mm -hmm. I do think I'm, I'm really excited about some of the things that the state has chosen to put some money into. Mm. This question of how do we live without the standardized test being the pure driver of what success means. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the kinds of questions that we need to use these dollars to figure out a new pathway mm -hmm. for. Um, but yeah. we're, I mean, it's a great question because on, I, we're learning right now what to do with this money. Yeah. Um, for me personally and in our environment, yeah. I mean, I feel like it gave me the opportunity to take care of our teachers. Yeah. Yeah. And that is so huge. So with very tight budgets and very slim margins, we're a young school, so yeah. we have uh, haven't been around for very long. So, um, you know, with, with those slim margins, it... Um, it's been more of a challenge. The federal dollars, I mean, in all honesty, got us through yeah. and, um, and helped us survive this. But I think now maybe we do focus on um, more materials for inquiry-based education. We can take care of our teachers a little more because it helped to offset some operating expenses. Um, so I think, I think it's only going to be a benefit. And I just hope that all those efforts that are made with the extra dollars don't then fizzle out mm -hmm. when they're not there. That's, that's a, it's just yeah. a temporary yeah. infusion. It is. And so the one thing you would like to do is to pay teachers more, mm -hmm. but we can't right. commit to that as a system right. because in two or three years, the money is gone and, yeah. and now we're gonna have to yeah. start laying yeah. off tons of teachers. I think yeah. we all as a community <laughs> need to take this moment and make a choice about mm. do we want to actually invest in schools mm. a bit more. Everyone mm. now knows how hard that job of being a teacher yeah. is and how undercompensated they were for the complexity. We were dealing with two or three kids in a house that we were trying to educate as parents. Mm -hmm. Teachers have 30 plus in a room in public schools. I mean, the complexity of that job in no way matched what the compensation was. And so mm -hmm. I do hope that we we can make those longer term investments if the communities rally around schools right now and say, you know yeah. what, this is really important to society and you guys are professionals. We see that now and we want to pay you as professionals. So I'm going to go now to Sarah and then I have a question for Justin. Okay. All right, Sarah, this um, is a ch second career, right? It is. So yeah. tell us a little <laughs> bit about how you got to be where you yeah. are. 
My, my students love this story. Um, and they, I, I bring in videos to show them. They think it's funny. Um, but so I started my career as a research scientist studying <clears throat> primates. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it is definitely a second career. But um, long story short, um, I lived in Kenya for four years doing dissertation research um, and following a group of wild monkeys around. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and then um, had my first son and realized that probably maybe a life of field research wasn't in the cards for me. Um, I started teaching science then, so um, since science was my background, so I started um, little by little um, teaching science. And then I got really excited about mm -hmm. things. I like, I like big ideas. I mm -hmm. like initiatives. Um, so I, I used to joke around with the administration when I was a science teacher and say, hey, I'm waiting for my greenhouse. You know, when, is, when am I going to get a greenhouse? And then one day I thought, you know what? I have this background. I wrote grants. I lived off of grants. Um, so I wrote a grant and got a grant to build a 60-foot greenhouse. And then, and then another grant to build an aquaponics unit and then a compost and then a chicken coop. And it just sort of grew. And then I grew into an environmental program mm. director. So um, found my way into administration there, uh, moved to Lexington, found Redwood Cooperative School really as a place for my second son. Mm -hmm. um, and then within a month was on the board and a science teacher um, and a mom there. So, um, so February of that year um, became the head of school mm -hmm. of Redwood. And so I had all this crazy experience and all of these different, I was very creative and resilient. Mm -hmm. So in all of that, I had to think big and think outside the box. But I uh, came to a point where I decided that I really needed some educational mm -hmm. leadership, um, professional training. Mm -hmm. And that's where I entered this program um, that I am going to continue with. So um, yeah. Didn't even get enough of us. No, I decided <laughs> so. to stay. Um, but so that's where that's the yeah. that's the journey that I took. So when you talked about being a parent involved in the school, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that about parents yeah. being involved in the school, yeah. and then what happened this year. Yeah, with that. yeah. So we are a cooperative school, mm -hmm. and parental family involvement okay. is a huge component of that. So not only in the amount of work that they do, but we do, you know, in order to offset tuition, but we do have an open door policy. We have basically families in the building, you know, family members in the building every day. Um, and so that was a big shift. Just even, mm. even the drop off in Carline and we, it, it was like a big party in the mornings mm. where people would walk their kids in and stop and chat. Um, and then to go to everybody is coming through the car line. Um, big shift. Our parents were so, and family members were so supportive and mm. so creative and so resilient themselves. So um, we had to offer work that was outside of the school building mm. and not anywhere near children and, you know, all of the other things. And so we had people coming in and shoveling snow and raking leaves and mowing the lawn. And we have one mom who comes every Monday afternoon to la do all the laminating for the teachers mm. once the kids are all out of the building. And um, we had people working from home for us and doing, you know, helping with marketing. And so they were creative and resilient themselves in finding ways that they could support the school too. So we've tried to really, that has been hard for us, but we've really tried to rally and engage our community. We've done so many more virtual things that some people mm. actually really like. Yeah. So we've had to do all of our events virtually, I, we did so many videos this year because we just mm -hmm. wanted people to get a peek inside the rooms. You know, this is what it's like for your child or grandchild or niece or nephew. Um, and so we just found all kinds of creative ways to keep them involved. The kids actually liked it too. One example is our auction is one of our biggest fundraisers yeah. and it's in-person adult only one evening. Well, this year it was a week long virtual and the kids got to create our videos for us oh, yeah. so they created items and then made videos and were really you know took pride in that so some of those things i think will actually linger well yeah that's it cooperative is right there in your name you know mm -hmm. the idea that community is involved yeah. and parents are involved so yeah. definitely had to be extra resilient in that mm -hmm. aspect yeah absolutely 
All right, so um, I think we were just talking about this. Three years ago or four years ago, Justin, you gave a talk for Creative Mornings. Uh, specifically, you kind of talked about this different ways of education and being very creative. Has that changed in the last couple of years? What's going on in that field and with STEAM Academy? Well, STEAM, obviously, yeah. super, super personal to me. Uh, last time we chatted, STEAM Academy was a great school that happened to be in a really old building. Yeah. Uh, that it was hard for the community to see how great we were as a public school. Um, but since that time, one of the actual weird things this year is we opened a tremendously awesome building on Georgetown Road. Yeah. The old Imani Baptist Church got transitioned into STEAM Academy. And it is spectacular, but no kids could come. And so that was a super weird period when we had this tremendous space um, and we couldn't use it. So. Uh, the kids are back in the building, but it's still um, spaced out. Like mm -hmm. we're not there yet, and I hope in August uh, we will be able to like fully utilize what we designed that building to do. And you know, let's hold a Creative Mornings event there sometime. Yeah, it's a we will open be invitation there. to you all yeah. um, because I'd love to show the community what that is. Because Steam represents what school can be, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, Redwood also represents what school can be. Mm -hmm. Right, so we're getting more and more examples now of alternatives to the standard model of school that we all sort of grew up with and know yeah. and we all learned from the same textbooks and mm -hmm. that that phase is fading into the past more and more since the last time we talked more and more and more schools across the state are doing this work mm. um, the it's a this type of work is a priority for the lieutenant governor this type of work mm. is a priority for the commissioner of education um, and so you have a lot more state level attention now being paid to providing different kinds of learning alternatives mm -hmm. to, to deal with this half of kids who didn't like normal yeah. school. I mean, wh how do we give them some choices so that they can fall in love with school, mm -hmm. own their own journeys, and then find their way in the world? Um, and STEAM was sort of designed to do that as a project between UK and Fayette County. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really thrilled about where we are, but I'm, I'm even more thrilled that it's becoming the new normal mm. that we're beginning to push up against those old barriers and, and start to unpack them. That doesn't mean school is like Walt Disney World all the time. Yeah. That's not what's going on. Um, but it's better if you're paying attention. And uh, we're, we're making a lot of progress. We have a long way to go. A long way to go, uh, but it's a really positive, optimistic story of resilience, even mm -hmm, in what yeah. school is and what school can be. And so uh, Kentucky should be increasingly proud of what we're doing with our schools. Yeah, if you yeah, haven't absolutely. watched his talk, go back and watch his talk. And I was seeing pictures of the building with collaboration spaces and all these interesting spaces. So I hope we will be we can have a Creative Mornings there. That would be amazing yep. to have some community involvement there. So we only have about five minutes left. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask one question and then um, a final question. So the last question we had from the audience is, um, and Justin, you train teachers. You're being trained as a teacher. Will this change the way we train teachers? I think absolutely. Yes. Just based on you know everything we've just been talking about, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where some of those federal dollars can go is in more professional learning. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think just in the ways that they do involve the kids, that we go back to developing a love of learning. Um, that school isn't about just punching numbers, but that we involve students in the process. We use more justice and democracy in education. Um, and allow them to be part of their learning journey. So, I mean, we're supposed to be creating, mm. you know, citizens, um, and I think we can focus more on that as a whole in Kentucky. Yeah. And as that begins to happen, we actually have an educator crisis in mm. Kentucky. We don't have nearly enough teachers right. in some areas, and and as a general statement, we're short on educators. Mm -hmm. But we're beginning to see slight upticks as young yeah. people can start to see themselves in this profession more and that's mm -hmm. the social justice coming out it's yeah. the democracy coming out yeah. it is the i get to lead my own projects rather be, than being told what to do from a textbook like that type of professionalism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is 
beginning to bloom a little bit and we're beginning just very beginnings mm -hmm. it's very early days but I think we are beginning to see upticks in the number yeah. of students thinking about teaching as their long-term career mm -hmm. because they are beginning to see other professionals make those professional choices mm -hmm. and they want that they mm -hmm. don't want to just be a robot mm -hmm. on a stage delivering content yeah. uh, so it's it's I think we're seeing positive flowers starting to bloom in the yeah. teacher training spaces. And then being able to help them learn early mm. how to really engage their students. I mean, I love nothing more than it, you know, at Redwood when a teacher comes to my door, which happens regularly, and says, I have this crazy idea. Uh -huh. And I'm like, you had me at crazy idea. Yeah, like, exactly. what is it? Let's go for it. And so it's so sad when you see teachers who are defeated. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I want to see more of that. And I want to see our training of teachers to lean more towards that, like how to think outside of the box so that you're so motivated and passionate about what you do that, you know, you can't help but um, have a trickle down effect to the kids. Yeah. All right. So this is going to be kind of to that theme of defeated because there was probably lots of points during this, during this year where we thought I'm defeated or I you know man I can't take on one more thing and right. this has been a nice way to reflect on resilience so what ways or who or what mm -hmm. helped you through resilience do you have any skills or tips hmm. I mean for me um, for me it was the students yeah. first and foremost I mean just whether I saw their faces on Zoom or in person, I mean, that, that helped me be resilient and just to remember why we're here and why we're doing it. Having those aha moments where you go, this is what's going to get us through. This is why we're here. Um, and then also the teachers. And then, you know, just mm -hmm. seeing them struggle through it, but then still have such a passion for their students. Um, and then uh, my family, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. my family took up so much of the slack this year um, so that I could do all of this craziness and, you know, be a mom. I mean, my husband had to take on so much more of everything just so that I could, just so that I could focus on Redwood, you know, yeah. as much as possible. And then also um, my own kids. Um, I have a really supportive, I feel like I'm giving an Oscar speech. I have a really yeah. supportive board. Um, who kind of encouraged me to continue with this program with Justin at the same time as, you know, just what do you, what do you need from us? We're kind yeah. of going to stay out of your way, but what do you need from us to get through this? So, um, and then I have the most amazing um, administrative staff in the office with me who, you know, literally took on when we struggled financially and couldn't mm -hmm. afford to pay someone to come in. Literally, we took on the chore of cleaning the bathrooms, yeah. you know, and cleaning common areas and sanitizing and temperature checks and health screenings. Yeah. And so everyone had to learn to take on jobs that they didn't take on in the past. And yeah, so lots of support. Well, lots of support, yeah, lots of people I lots hear of about. Support. Professors, yeah. you know, encouraging. No, professors are, don't give professors yeah. any love. Everyone else gets love. I'm going to be done with my speech, yeah. Um, yeah. I would just add to that. Mm -hmm because the same things happen in my own life with mm. uh, my own wife and yeah. families and teams that everybody rallied. Mm -hmm. You add into that mix for me personally, cancer, yeah, this word yeah. to have to deal yeah. with yeah. over the last yeah. year and the sleepless nights. I mean, there was, mm. there's, there's fear in that word, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah. Um, but also in that word is a lot of empathy for each other. Mm. And I think, um, I got to experience so much of that empathy and also openness. I am a lot more loving outwardly mm. as a human than I was before. Um, the combination of pandemic and cancer and racial unrest and a lot that I think had to force mm -hmm. us to be more open um, with who we are and who we, the feelings that we have towards other people. And I, I don't want us to lose that. I'm not going to lose that personally because that's why cancer was a blessing. Mm. Um, but if we all adopted that same mentality right now and were more open and honest, just as you were saying with the administrative staff, like here's mm -hmm. what we need. We don't have the dollars yeah. right now for the kind of cleaning staff we would normally do. Um, but here's what we need and can you help on this? And people were so overflowing with mm -hmm. help 
uh, this last year, we got so many meals delivered to the house. Like there were times oh, I didn't yeah. even know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, but that love and openness with each other, that mm -hmm. is what got me through. Yeah. And if we can hold that, I think we'll be a much stronger city and a much stronger community. I think so too. The, the term, you know, we're a team mm. has become a little cliche, but I've never yeah. felt more a part of several different teams. And, and that idea that we really were in it together and we were doing something that was so out of the ordinary um, that, and we had to just figure it out as we went along. It was one of the times where we didn't have all the answers in advance, but that actually was probably good because we relied on each other and we had to figure it out together. Yeah. So it really felt so much like, you know, we were all part of a team from, you know, the city of Lexington to our team at Redwood to family teams and friends and colleagues. Well, and I'm hearing this theme of it may have seemed maybe early on that your your world got so small and so few people, but the more you asked for help or the more you talked mm -hmm. to people, you realized that it was a, a bigger people, a bigger group surrounding yeah. you. Your world was bigger, and maybe mm -hmm. you weren't seeing them all the time, but people were dropping off food or mm -hmm. dropping off, you know, helping with, um, you, were, you were coming after work and you weren't even mm -hmm. seeing them, yeah. that your world got bigger. Well, I want to thank both of you. This has been a very reflective moment on the theme resilient that we've heard over and over and over uh, this year of how to be resilient. So I wanna thank both of you. We learned so much um, today. We're really excited and really honored to have them. We learned that there may be a moment that you need to pause. There may be a moment that you need to raise other things to higher priorities. We talked a lot about raising the priority of social equity and maybe letting some other things go by. We learned about um, opening up your world and having more people in your world and love and kindness. Um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you to our Creative Morning community. We will continue this. We will see you next month with an, another awesome speaker that we're really excited about. And I like to end by saying everyone is creative and everyone is welcome. Thank you.